Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dan Carpenter, the Ali S. Freed Professor of Government and Faculty Director of the Social Sciences uh, program here at Radcliffe, uh, the Harvard Radcliffe Institute. Welcome to this afternoon's book talk with the award-winning legal historian and Dean of the Institute, Tomiko Brown-Nagan. Before we begin, I want to express the Institute's gratitude to the members of the Radcliffe Institute and the Radcliffe Institute Leadership Society and all of the Institute's annual donors whose generosity keeps Radcliffe programming free and open to the public. Thank you. This afternoon, Dean Brown Nagan will discuss her new book, Civil Rights Queen, Constance Baker Motley and the Struggle for Equality. The first major biography of the pathbreaking lawyer, politician, and judge Constance Baker Motley. Civil Rights Queen is, to quote a recent review in the New York Times, an illuminating, thoughtful, and poignant assessment of a brave and brilliant woman who helped reconfigure the system before she became a part of it. In the book, Dean Brown Nagan tells the story of Motley's remarkable life in the context of the momentous changes to American law and policy in the 20th century, changes in which Motley herself played a critical role and one that has all too often gone unacknowledged. And let me say, uh, as a card-carrying political scientist, that I think this is a, a volume uh, essential not only for uh, historians, um, but for anybody who wants to study social movements, political activism, uh, judicial politics, and American racial politics. In addition to her leadership of Radcliffe, Dean Brown Nagan is the Daniel P. S. Paul Professor of Constitutional Law at Harvard Law School. She's professor in the history of history in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences, and she is chair of Harvard's Presidential Committee on Harvard and the Legacy of Slavery. She's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the American Law Institute, and the American Philosophical Society. Dean Brown Nagan's previous book, Courage to Dissent, Atlanta and the Long History of the Civil Rights Movement, won six different awards, including the prestigious Bancroft Prize in US history. This afternoon's program will begin with a brief reading from Dean Brown Nagan, after which she'll engage in conversation with our esteemed colleague, the award-winning scholar, filmmaker, and literary critic, Henry Louis Gates, Jr. Professor Gates is the Alphonse Fletcher, Jr. University Professor and Director of the Hutchins Center for African and African-American Research at Harvard University. He is also the author of numerous books and has hosted and produced more than 20 documentary films, including The Black Church on PBS, Black Art in the Absence of Light on HBO, and the long-running PBS series, Finding Your Roots. Finding, following their conversation, we'll then turn to audience questions, which will be conveyed to Dean Brown Nagan and Professor Gates by Jelani Hayes, who is both a doctoral student in history at Harvard and a JD candidate at Yale Law School. You can use the Q&A feature on Zoom to submit your questions at any point during the program. We only ask that you keep your questions brief so we can address as many of them as possible. And now it's my pleasure to give the virtual floor to my Dean, Tamiko Brown Nagan. Thank you so much, Dan, for that lovely introduction and to Skip and Jelani for being here today. I'm delighted to share from my book on Constance Baker Motley. I'm going to briefly read from the chapter about Motley's most famous case, which was the battle to desegregate the University of Mississippi. This man has got to be crazy, Thurgood Marshall yelled to Motley in January of 1961. That's your case. Marshall had descended upon Motley's office waving a letter from James Meredith. The missive contained such a preposterous idea that Marshall thought the writer must be out of his mind. 
I am submitting an application for admission to the University of Mississippi, Meredith wrote, and I am anticipating encountering difficulty with various agencies here in the state. In view of the brewing trouble, Meredith requested Marshall's legal assistance. After Marshall had finished laughing about Meredith's proposal to sue Ole Miss, he washed his hands of the case. Marshall knew that Constance Baker Motley had the smart, smarts and courtroom skills to do the job, and he thought her gender would be an advantage. The fight to desegregate Ole Miss might get someone killed, but in the context of Mississippi's white supremacist yet chivalrous culture, as Marshall saw it, a black woman would fare better than a black man. Any white supremacist, he opined, would scarcely think twice about murdering a black man, but he might hesitate to lynch a black woman. The very idea of a black woman lawyer violently clashed with the worldview of Dugas Shands Esquire, the white male lawyer who defended Ole Miss. Shands refused to address the ink fund lawyer in the customary manner as Mrs. Motley. Instead, he used only indirect references calling Motley her or she. At one point early on, Motley jumped to her feet in a bid to put an end to the charade. But the tipping point occurred when Shans called her Constance. Motley immediately objected. I would like for Mr. Shans not to call me by my first name, Motley insisted. Henceforth, the lawyer referred to Motley as the New York Council. After months of struggle and endless delays, Meredith had had enough. Browbeaten by white resistance, Meredith wrote to Motley, resigned. I will not attempt to obtain an undergraduate degree from the University of Mississippi, the letter proclaimed. Keenly aware that Motley, who had poured herself into the case, would be disappointed in his decision, Meredith pleaded for understanding. I am human after all, he wrote. Meredith had grown tired of waiting for a deliverance that never came. Life had passed him by. His peers had graduated from college, begun careers, and moved on with their lives. In the meantime, he and his family had endured a high cost, literally and figuratively, fighting to integrate the University of Mississippi. Motley was stunned by this message. In order to salvage her case and support her client, Motley morphed from lawyer to therapist, a role she often played in high stakes civil rights cases. To get a handle on the fraught situation, the pair would talk in Motley's New York City apartment where Meredith could taste freedom. There, Motley cajoled Meredith. She persuaded him that he had gone too far and that too much had been invested in the case by the Ink Fund and the Federal Court of Appeals to abandon the litigation. Just as Meredith reached his breaking point, support arrived precisely as Motley had promised. On September 10th, 1962, U.S. Supreme Court Justice Hugo Black intervened, halting any further action preventing James Meredith's matriculation to Old Miss. While in Mississippi, Motley built community with a small band of lawyers and activists who took part in LDF's effort to end Jim Crow in the state. She leaned on Megar Evers, the NAACP's most prominent operative in Mississippi, who often invited Motley to his home where she enjoyed home cooked meals and fellowship with Evers, his wife and their children. But only one month after Motley left Mississippi for the last time, Megar Evers was assassinated. It devastated her. Motley couldn't get out of bed for weeks following his death and she couldn't even bring herself to attend his funeral. Nevertheless, she had left the state victorious Constance Baker Motley emerged as one of the most respected lawyers in America. A story in the New York Times titled Integrations Advocate captured the professional heights to which Motley had soared. Quote, a tall striking woman with piercing dark eyes is almost always in the courtroom in the eye of the hurricane surrounding the struggle for civil rights in the South. Motley's successful fight to desegregate Ole Miss had brought her public esteem and professional success, along with devastating loss and profound pain. Thank you so much, 
Tomiko, um, I hate to to interrupt. It's so uh, beautiful. I was, uh, uh, you know, in Medgar Evers' house with her eating that eating the meal, and then thinking about her not being able to get out of bed. You write beautifully, and, and, and it's great, and it's an honor for me. Thank you very much to invite me to um, participate in this event and to uh, ask you a few questions mm. uh, because you and I share. I think several things, but one we share most is that we both love Constance Baker Mott. Indeed. Um, what did you know about her growing up? Connie Motley is not a household name. When did you, when did she come into your consciousness and what attracted you uh, to the long arduous task of writing a biography of someone? Mm, good questions. Well, I have to say when I was growing up, I knew, a lot about Thurgood Marshall. He was an inspiration to me as I formed an idea pretty early in my young life to attend law school. Uh, and yet Constance Baker Motley was not known to me until um, pretty late in my education. And Skip, I can't even remember when I first uh, learned her name, but of course, when I was writing my book on Atlanta and the civil rights movement, I had the occasion to write a biographical sketch of Constance Baker Motley because she litigated the Atlanta school desegregation case all the way to the Supreme Court. And one of the ways that I sought to draw people in into the story was to write a bit about the, the lawyers who uh, handled these cases. And it was at that time that I discovered that there was relatively little scholarly uh, work on Constance Baker Motley. And I thought that uh, it needed to be corrected because of what I now know about her. Uh, and that is that she was a civil rights queen. She was a counterpart to Thurgood Marshall. Uh, he knew how good she was. You know, there's a a section of my book where I talk about how Marshall said that uh, Connie Motley just walked in and took over, uh, which, <laughs> you know, which summarizes uh, her long career at the Ink Fund, all that she did, handling so many cases, which I'm happy to talk about uh, uh, later. But I, I do want to answer your question about um, writing a biography. Um, of anyone, much less Constance Baker Motley, you know, is, it is a different uh, experience than um, I have had in the past, whether, you know, writing a monograph or law review articles. Uh, and it, it requires one to seek to recreate and then inhabit the life uh, of an individual to really labor, to get it right, to explore the personality. And as you know, Skip, that's not that easy when it comes to <laughs> um, uh, Connie Motley because she was pretty reserved. Mm -hmm. um, she, you know, she put her head down and she did the work. She didn't try to be the center of attention. Um, and judges are notorious. Uh, that's one word for it. I suppose it's a, a good thing and another perspective for not leaving evidence behind uh, of their <laughs> interior life. Uh, and, and so it, it, was, it was a real challenge, but also a joy. You know, I, um, I earned my law degree from New Haven, so I'd spent time there. But when I decided to write this book, I went back there and looked at the city through her eyes. She grew up in the presence of Yale, um, in the shadow of Yale, I might say. Uh, mm -hmm. I went to Nevis, uh, and explored Nevis where her parents uh, immigrated from uh, and really just got to know uh, Connie Motley through her friends, her family. And it was just uh, quite, quite a rewarding experience to be able to, uh, you know, see, see the world through her eyes. Who is she? Oh, uh, I like that Nevis part. I'm thinking about writing a biography. Give me the title. Give me the name of somebody who else who lived on Nevis. That's a good idea. I don't know why that slipped my mind there. <laughs> uh, who, who is she now that you're on the other side of the, the, the journey? Sure. Well, uh, as I said, she's the counterpart to Thurgood Marshall. 
and a person who had tremendous impact in the civil rights movement, and then as a New York politician, and then finally capping off her career as the first Black woman appointed to the federal judiciary. Now, in mm -hmm. terms of her civil rights uh, uh, experiences, she litigated or helped uh, to litigate a whole range of, of cases that uh, redefined the legal architecture of America. So Brown versus Board of Education, uh, a, a number of cases that came after Brown, including desegregation, the desegregation case in Atlanta. She desegregated uh, higher education in the South, uh, litigating the University of Georgia case with uh, Charlene Hunter Galt and Hamilton Holmes. Uh, the University of Alabama case, and of course, Ole Miss. And then there are all these other cases. She was involved in uh, establishing a precedent around the right to counsel. She represented Dr. King and other civil rights protesters. And so she really was there in the thick of it. And uh, just wonderful to recreate those moments and show why it's significant to know about Motley being in the room and doing all of that work. Um, and I, I'm happy to go on, Skip, or, or give you a chance to come back in and ask another question. No, I, I, have, um, I, I have several more to, uh, <laughs> to ask. I'm interested in what you think of her as a person. What made her tick? You know, mm -hmm. you, you recite her great triumphs, and, and you, you champion those well, but behind that mask, and she did wear a mask. She was a very private uh, person for uh, Magic Complex reasons. You've lived with her for how many years? How, how long have, has it taken for you to complete this project? Sure, from idea to publication, about a decade. Okay, That's you've lived first. with this person for a decade. Mm -hmm. What made her tick? Tell me about her. What was she like without that robe on without outside of the courtroom? Sure, well, uh, a defining um, feature of her psychology and her experience was the, the immigrant experience. Her mm -hmm. parents, as I mentioned, were uh, from Nevis and came to this country in the early 20th century and uh, imparted cultural values that were important in shaping her and also in facilitating her uh, improbable climb in the legal profession. And I mean, they were you know, culturally conservative. Uh, they were uh, happy to be a part of the British Empire. Um, <laughs> uh, they uh, it, certainly, the father taught uh, Motley to Baker at the time to think of herself and her people, uh, West Indians, as superior to African Americans. Uh, mm -hmm. And so it's ironic that she would go on to be a civil rights lawyer who, uh, of course, represented uh, so many African Americans, particularly in the South. Um, she believed in the politics of respectability. Uh, and, mm -hmm. you know, that comes out in a number of places, including in the University of Alabama case, where I discuss how there was, uh, there were, initially, there were two plaintiffs, uh, one of whom was essentially dismissed from the case because the university assassinated her character, because mm -hmm. she had become pregnant out of, uh, before marriage, and the NAACP mm -hmm. dropped her. And mm -hmm. Motley had no problem doing that uh, because, mm -hmm. you know, she and the other lawyers thought you had to have the smartest, most, you know, well put together from the best background plaintiffs in order to litigate these cases. And mm -hmm. I see that as a through line uh, in her life. You know, she loved her family. You know, her son, Joel, uh, yeah. and, and his father, uh, uh, Joel Jr., she, she cared deeply about her family, her extended family. You know, she thought of herself as a, she loved the state of Connecticut, uh, she thought of herself as a, a New Englander and mm -hmm. really distinguished that experience from the Deep South experience in some ways that uh, are, I think are valid in other ways, not so much. Mm -hmm. um, uh, what else can I tell you? She was a gracious person. 
a gracious person, a physically imposing person. Mm-hmm. You know, I remember when I was clerking on the Southern District of New York, the same trial court that she served on, I was clerking for Bob Carter, her um, colleague from the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, just seeing her walk through the courtroom. It is really true. She was like a queen. People repeatedly <laughs> say that because she was she was imperial. She was she carried herself in a way that uh, she commanded respect and demanded respect from uh, individuals. And uh, she was she was beloved by those who knew her. And uh, as I say repeatedly, she did wear a mask. And so not a lot of people were allowed to peek behind that mask, but those who uh, were fortunate enough to really get to know her just loved her and thought that she was was just a great person and one who, despite all that she achieved, was was modest uh, Mm -hmm. and was respectful of others. I tell a story about how she was on the vineyard uh, with some of her friends and Bill Clinton uh, walks by the golf club and she she asks everybody to stand up and she when he comes over she extends her hand to introduce herself as if she's just like anybody you know <laughs> and, and people know who who Connie Motley was and uh, Bill Clinton in his way says you know you don't have to introduce yourself I know exactly who you are uh, but that story which is from pretty late in her life is revelatory just mm-hmm. suggesting her modesty and her graciousness and those are you know fantastic uh, attributes to have I believe no, and a, a fantastic description. She also had a great sense of humor, and she could cook. She was a really <laughs> fabulous um, uh, cook, and uh, I, I loved having dinner with them at their summer home in uh, in Connecticut. Um, what was it like for you to shift your focus to the North, mm. where where Judge Motley grew up in New Haven and was such a prominent political leader, of course, in in New York City? What's the difference between writing about um, civil rights and the race in the in the South as opposed to the North, or is there a difference? Mm -hmm. Great question. I I will say that writing about her her context, her background uh, in Connecticut did allow me to encounter, describe, and seek to understand the Black immigrant experience in a way that I had not had the opportunity to do uh, so before, and that was important. Uh, I think what I took away from that skip is like Mary Waters says, turns out that Caribbean immigrants are immigrants, uh, right. right? And so a defining feature of the immigrant experience in this country is often uh, uh, learning to separate oneself from African Americans and to define mm-hmm. oneself against African Americans. And so that is certainly the story that I would tell about her father. Um, and the lessons that he taught her. Uh, It it also was, um, you know, uh, uh, I was writing against um, the grain in describing life in the North. So Motley told a story about the North that drew a sharp line between Connecticut and, you know, the places where we grew up, Skip, right? Mm-hmm. She, she saw the, the, the South, the Deep South in particular, as fundamentally uh, different. She, um, but but she, she was contradictory in how she described Connecticut. On the one hand, she described it as being separate and apart and welcoming. She says that, you know, race was really, racism was really not a big factor in her growing up. But on the other hand, she describes how all of her male relatives worked for Yale University, uh, virtually all, and they worked in study and good jobs, but they're, they're um, you know, jobs that are, that are not particularly prestigious. They had um, lost status when they moved from Nevis to New Haven, which is a way of saying that there was racism all over this country mm-hmm. uh, and, and barriers to uh, climbing to um, to entry into the workplace, and I I do think that Motley glosses over some of that, uh, which mm-hmm. she certainly comes to know when she's litigating cases, some cases in the north uh, around housing and um, uh, employment. 
but it's a way, you know, it's a way of um, thinking about the stories we tell ourselves as we mm -hmm. to uh, achieve whatever it is that we want to achieve. Right. Uh, the last thing I will say is, you know, New York City politics, my goodness, um, just a <laughs> lot going on there. Um, I was particularly interested to write about Motley's, the way she was able to maneuver uh, mm -hmm. into New York City politics. She was, you know, she had sponsors who were uh, white men, uh, allies, uh, and some black male allies, also a lot of people who thought that she, um, she should stay in her lane, uh, <laughs> right. you know, and that yeah. she, she was not uh, the most authentic uh, representative of African Americans, uh, mm -hmm. whatever, you know, people thought that would be, Connie Motley didn't seem to be it by mm -hmm. looking at her. And I also was able to tell a story about gender uh, because mm -hmm. she was so in the public eye when she was the Manhattan Borough President, and I talk about how there was scrutiny of, you know, the way she looked and her family. You know, people wanted to know um, really what was going on in that household that she was out. She was out <laughs> doing all the things that she was doing. Who was, you know, with looking after Joel and so forth. And so it really was just a a window that allowed me to talk about how rich her experience was and to reflect um, the role of women and stereotypes about women's place uh, at that moment in American history. Most people wrongly think of the movement, uh, particularly in the courtroom, as a male story from Charles Hamilton Houston to Thurgood Marshall and, of course, the nine justices on the Supreme Court who struck down uh, Plessy v. Ferguson in the 54 Brown decision. But women played pivotal roles too. And I'm thinking, of course, of Polly Murray and Constance Baker Motley. How should we think of her in the overall story and history of the civil rights movement? And how does her work complicate the narrative of Brown and its related cases? Mm -hmm. Um, so uh, thank you for that compound question. I'll, I'll, <laughs> choose, I'll choose some bits to answer. So, um, you know, one of the things I try to do in the book is to place her within a network of women, including Pauli Murray, Shirley Chisholm, Bella Abzug, uh, and Ella Baker, and to um, discuss the common experiences that they have and had. And some of those uh, were um, to an extent feeling like they were on the periphery of the, uh, the, the spotlight um, or the decision-making processes in the movement uh, because the movement as it is frequently told is all about charismatic leadership. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and none of those women really fit that mold. Um, at the same time, looking at the movement through the lens of Constance Baker Motley allows us to um, tell a story that is quite still relatable, that's relatable to mm -hmm. issues uh, of our time. So when I discuss the Brown case, um, I note that Motley mm -hmm. is pregnant and has her son, Joel, um, and he's an infant and then a toddler around the same time as she's working on, you know, the complaint and the briefs and helping to, to uh, do all of the work that goes into Brown versus Board of Education. So she's really balancing her professional life and her home life in a way that is quite unusual. So, mm -hmm. you know, she, in addition to having family support, she hires help. Um, and then she has to uh, just contend with all that anyone has to contend with when one has a high powered job and, and responsibility there. Uh, you know, she's working, at, she's the only woman in uh, among those lawyers and, uh, you know, I, I discuss uh, what that might have been like. Um, and mm -hmm. and it, it really does thicken uh, thicken the plot um, when one brings in someone like Motley, including because, Skip, and this is something I, I'm really um, just taken with, it, it, it says something to us about how 
uh, stereotypically male leadership styles uh, mm -hmm. are valued and were valued in the movement and in our memory of the movement, while the leadership styles of women uh, uh, were not so so valued, right? Um, mm -hmm. So think about Ella Baker and how mm -hmm. she um, taught the students in the movement to be more collaborative and to think about democracy mm -hmm. and change in terms of participatory democracy. With mm -hmm. Motley, um, you know, she was a counterpart to Marshall, but unlike him uh, mm -hmm. in the way that she carried herself and went about her her business and her uh, professional life, and yet she's quite effective. And so mm -hmm. uh, I want to, there's a lesson in that for us about uh, what we might lose when we overlook um, those less masculine, amped up uh, leadership styles that are, are valued often in business or academia uh, throughout society. Oh yeah, I hate those styles myself. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know. <laughs> Could she had LBJ? LBJ loved Constance Baker Motley, according to everybody, right? Mm. Um, it could she. First of all, is that right? I've always heard that. I never met LBJ. So, first of all, is that right? And secondly, could if he had won a second term, might she have made it to the court, or one black person would just would have been more than enough at that time? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so, so, so far as, as I can tell, uh, LBJ really admired Constance Baker Motley, and he was so proud to have appointed her to the court. Uh, he, she, was, she was vetted comprehensively, so he talked to, and his staff talked to, you know, all of the civil rights leaders. Uh, he, he talked to judges before whom she had appeared. Uh, and everyone was laudatory of her, and that is why you know she she got the nod in terms of her promotion prospects. So you should know that originally LBJ wanted to to appoint her to the Court of Appeals to the mm -hmm. Second Circuit, uh, mm -hmm. but there was tremendous uh, backlash blowback against that, um, mm -hmm. And he didn't do it. He told her to work her way up to the Second Circuit. Uh, but that became a complicated proposition. Uh, one, because he didn't get a second term. And then mm -hmm. the other opportunities for promotion occurred under Republicans. But also because uh, when she was working her way up, she was deciding cases. And some of those cases were controversial cases. Mm -hmm. And so when she was considered for promotion, um, uh, some people held her background as a civil rights lawyer against her, as well as some of the cases that she decided uh, on the court that were considered, um, you know, too liberal. Mm -hmm. is what I'm hmm. It's interesting. What in looking back to Miko, uh, her greatest accomplishments, but also her greatest disappointments. Mm hmm. Um, well, the, the accomplishment, her, her whole life, you know, to have this life, it's uh, three phases where she uh, achieved so much uh, against incredible odds in every phase of it. You know, she's a, she's, she's a one woman civil rights movement uh, <laughs> yeah. in, in, in terms of, you know, what she was able to achieve for others and then what she achieved in her own professional life. Mm -hmm. um, uh, including on the bench where she decided some cases that opened up the professional workforce, workplace to women, uh, including for women journalists. There's a case involving Melissa Lucky, uh, mm -hmm. who was a journalist who wanted to cover uh, the World Series by actually going into the clubhouse. Famous uh, case. Uh, yeah. I remember when case. I heard that she went, Connie just stepped out there and got, got women to go, uh, they could go to the locker room, right? That's right, and it was so controversial. And you know, the intersection of sports and locker rooms, and uh, a, a woman professional working in a, an arena where she was unexpected as a sports writer, journalist. Mm -hmm. um, she another case that was so important is uh, the case of Martin Sastre, who was a jailhouse lawyer who brought a case after he was confined. Uh, at Attica and uh, 
Greenhaven uh, uh, saying that his solitary confinement was unconstitutional. She decided for him under the Eighth Amendment. She awarded him damages. Mm. Um, and this was met unfavorably, shall we say, by law enforcement. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, she was a, a, a hero to um, those who were at the beginning of the struggle for prisoners' rights, uh, helping to establish the principle um, that incarcerated people retain their dignity uh, mm -hmm. and retain their constitutional rights, a very important case. And I could go on and on. In terms of her biggest disappointment, it would have to be um, her her failure to achieve promotion after Thurgood Marshall left the Inc. Fund. Um, mm -hmm. She was disappointed by that. She thought that it had something to do with gender. Uh, she also uh, thought that it had something to do with race. Um, you know, a lot of uh, lawyers, Black lawyers, uh, thought that one of them be, would be promoted and they were not. Um, on the other hand, she was so grateful to Thurgood Marshall all of her life uh, for everything that he did to make her career. Uh, so disappointed with her mentors and some of the decision makers there, but ultimately uh, was you know, very happy to, to recognize that in hiring her in 1945 and 46 and supporting her for all of those years, working with her at the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, he uh, did something that uh, other men uh, who were in power in law firms and elsewhere simply were not doing. Yeah, absolutely. We're going to transition to um, questions from um, our very, very large and riveted um, audience. And Jelani Hayes is going to curate those. But just a quick final question, which is, did, the, did living with this person for 12 years uh, have an effect on you? Do you feel <laughs> Constance Motley changed you, Tamiko? Hmm. I don't know that I would say she changed me, Skip. Uh, although maybe you know, doing this book, completing this book, while also uh, having so many other responsibilities, probably made me more efficient and and even more disciplined. Uh, I, I will say that she likely validated some pre-existing tendencies. Uh, mm -hmm. or, or, or values, one of which is the imperative of identifying and nurturing talent. Mm -hmm. I uh, am so committed to that and was so happy to read about how, you know, Motley was the first, but she wanted to ensure that she was not the last. So mm -hmm. she, she hired uh, 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 law students, law graduates to work in her chambers who um, were that included uh, African Americans, people of color, and women, not something being done uh, often in other chambers. She uh, helped, you know, Sonia Sotomayor, the Associate Justice, and other uh, women who joined the bench after her. She would talk to high school students and, and middle school students to inspire them. And it, it's so admirable to have read about that. It, it validates something that I think certainly those of us who um, uh, are working in higher education should be doing. Thanks. Thank you. Time. Thank you. Just uh, on behalf of other academics uh, and scholars professionally, but also personally, because I, I, I admired her so very much and I loved her. I just want to thank you for for uh, writing such a brilliant biography, which I commend to everyone. And I'm sure, and I'm keeping my fingers crossed that there will be prizes, more prizes to come for this book, just like uh, your last book. Jelani, take it away. Thank you, Skip. You're welcome. Thank you, Professor Gates. And thank you so much, Dean brown Hagen, for having me here. We have a lot of questions, as you might imagine, and we'll try to get to as many as possible in the time that we have left. The first question, Dean brown Negan, asks you to uh, characterize how Motley understood her own historical significance during her lifetime. Mm. Uh, good question. I would say that she understood that through her work with the NAACP Legal Defense Fund that she was making history. 
when she was working on the Ole Miss case, which was so arduous, she would often uh, just go and sit on the banks of the Mississippi, and uh, she recounts this in her memoir, and talk about how she was being tested. She was being tested, and yet she understood that um, the, the, she and the lawyers were um, they were remaking American law, and she had to endure despite the challenges because uh, of the history-making turn. She understood the significance of being a first in uh, New York City politics, in uh, being a first as the first Black woman on the bench. She understood that uh, there was significant scrutiny attached to being the first. Uh, there's this quote where um, when she, after she's nominated for the bench in a, you know, a quiet uh, time, she, she says um, that, you know, everyone's going to be looking at me and, and which is, you know, it, it's, it's personally significant. You know, it, it's a, a moment when she is vulnerable and emotional. And so she understood very well who she was, but I, I would note uh, Jelani and to the audience member that as I sat in my conversation with Skip, um, Judge Motley showed great humility, great humility, uh, and was very interested in bringing people along, uh, in setting people at ease, and so to her, being a history maker did not mean that, uh, you know, she needed to wear it on her shoulders is the way I'll put it. Thank you. Uh, we have another question here. Um, an audience member wants to know, what does Motley think of the criticisms of integration as the primary strategy for racial equity, including those criticisms put forth by civil rights attorney, Derek Bell? Mm. Uh, you know, short answer, not much. I mean, she thought that her, her work was vitally important in Brown, and she was a little, um, I will say, annoyed with people who, you know, 20 years later or 30 years later, um, didn't quite understand the, the, the significance just in terms of the law itself. You know, Brown is is considered by consensus the most important constitutional case in 20th century uh, history. And she was proud of that work. She did understand um, that some black communities and individuals became frustrated um, with Brown, but she would see that frustration as a byproduct of the decision not being properly implemented. Um, not, she, she never, um, to my knowledge, moved away from the uh, from faith in the basic principle that schools uh, ought to be desegregated. Um, I, I, you know, she was great friends uh, with Derek Bell, um, and I'm sure that she appreciated his scholarship. Uh, but I, I also think that he took his critique to places that I, I can't imagine that she would have gone. Another audience member asked um, about her relationship to Shirley Chisholm, if she had one. I'd like to broaden the question a bit and ask you to characterize her relationship with other prominent women in law and politics. Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, Jelani, and to the questioner. She did have a relationship with Shirley Chisholm. They were friends. They overlapped in the New York legislature. Uh, Motley was in the New York Senate when uh, Shirley Chisholm was elected to the lower chamber, and they followed each other's careers. Shirley, you know, wrote her a note of congratulations at every, you know, for every uh, achievement thereafter for Motley, of which there are many. Um, Shirley Chisholm, Polly Murray, uh, Bella Abzug, all of these women were a part of, a, of an activist community. And yet I do make the point in my book that Motley set herself apart in terms of her rhetoric. For instance, um, she did not, she, she never said that she was a feminist. In fact, she said she wasn't a feminist. 
when she was Manhattan Borough President at a time when others were um, uh, more obviously interested in foregrounding gender uh, and who would be a part of the women's liberation movement. Uh, Motley didn't spend a lot of time articulating her feminism. She just did it is the way I explain it. Uh, and all of those women, Ella Baker, uh, Shirley Chisholm, Polly Murray, they respected one another uh, and also respected, I would say, their different approaches to activism. And certainly all of them cheered her on. They were excited that she was appointed to the bench. They wanted her to be promoted. Uh, they put a lot of faith that uh, she would be able to issue decisions that validated the objectives of the civil rights and women's rights movement, um, which she did sometimes, but not always. And how helpful was Motley's autobiography in your research? It was helpful, but I, I wanna go back to um, helpful in establishing um, the range of cases in which she was involved in basic facts. But I do want to say that, you know, it, it, Motley saw the world wrote like a lawyer. So there's not a lot in that book uh, and, and the judge that she was. So she talks about developments in the law quite a bit, which were important to know about. Uh, not a lot in that book is personal. And the um, the thing is, I, I said to Skip that I needed to do as a biographer was to get to know her. So there was a lot of inference drawing uh, on my part to try to figure out, you know, uh, even put together her her um, her personal family history with the cases that she was litigating, um, and and to try to see the significance of that. So it was it was helpful. Uh, I commend it to people. Um, and yet for me, I had to do a lot more digging to get the true story on Constance Baker Motley, or inter my interpretation, I should say, of Constance Baker Motley. And speaking of personal, um, can you talk a little bit more about how the choices that she made in her personal life helped to make her career in law and politics possible? Uh, sure, I can talk about that. She was married to Joel Motley, who um, was a real estate broker in uh, New York. He was uh, uh, just a wonderfully supportive spouse and to a person, everyone to whom I spoke about Judge Motley pointed out how vital he was to her ability to do what she did as a professional. Uh, you know, he didn't compete with her. Um, he was supportive. He would, when she was on the bench, come to the courthouse every day, deliver her there, and then come and pick her up uh, every day. Just a doting spouse. He also uh, was a partner in the raising of their son, uh, Joel the Third. She only had one child, uh, which you know strikes me as relevant to one. Uh, could be relevant, I should say, to uh, one's ability to work outside the home, the number of kids that one ha has. Uh, she, um, she hired uh, professional help to, to you know, do the work that she needed to do outside of the home. So housekeeper, um, uh, cook, that sort of thing. Those were important choices for her. And by the way, she was not shy about saying she needed to do those things uh, in order to in order to do the work that she did outside of of the home. And uh, what else can I say about her personal choices? I think those are the the main ones. Her spouse. Uh, and the way that she ran her household and her, her reproductive choices. We have a few folks who wanna know what surprised you the most in writing this book. What surprised me the most? Um, well, I, I don't say it's surprising necessarily, but it is pretty significant. Just the extent to which her life was under threat when she was working on all of those cases in the South. Um, you know, in the excerpt, I 
note that Thurgood Marshall uh, thought, and you know, he he was joking, but not joking, that being a, a woman gave her some advantage when she was in Mississippi. Well, I recount in the book uh, all of these, you know, experiences, uh, anxiety-provoking experiences, where, uh, for instance, I mentioned Megger Evers. Uh, they would be tailed by the state police when they're driving back and forth uh, to the, the federal courthouse. Uh, and that's just, I mean, it's horrifying to think of that. Um, she could not stay in hotels when she traveled throughout the South. And so she would stay with whoever would take her in in the African-American community. And she spent a lot of time with Megger Evers and she, she didn't feel safe and, and rightly so. Um, you know, when she was in Alabama the first time, she had men stationed with guns guarding her, guarding, you know, other lawyers as they went about their work. And just imagine doing all of that intellectual work and doing it under threat of one's life. Uh, a great deal of courage required and just a sense of being on a mission. One could only do that kind of work if you know, one really thought that it needed to be done and that you were the one to do it. You know, think about, um, you know, litigating these cases uh, under all of this threat. She talks about not having enough to eat often because she, she couldn't um, eat in restaurants either. And then having a child at home, right? So, and having a husband at home. And you, you would have to be truly devoted uh, to the cause as she was um, to have made those choices. And, and oh boy, am I glad and are we glad that she, she did. Thank you. Uh, one of our participants would like to know how might Motley advise us today in responding to the crusade against voting rights? Hmm. Um, well, let's broaden that to the, the threat uh, more generally um, to many of the achievements of the civil rights era. Um, she would advise us to get to work, right? She, she did her part and she would note that um, the work that she and Thurgood Marshall, Jack Greenberg, Robert Carter, and so many others did was over the course of many years. They didn't do it overnight, right? Um, uh, they, uh, you know, followed a plan that was a multi-year plan with incremental steps, um, well thought out with, you know, um, uh, you know, she would, she would encourage resilience uh, and just getting to work. Freedom is a constant struggle, I'm sure that she would say. And moreover, you know, yes, there's an assault on voting rights. It's also the case um, that there is, there are incredible political mobilizations, uh, nevertheless, including we saw you know, during the presidential elections with people standing online for hours at a time. And so she would acknowledge the threat, but this was a person of, you know, great fortitude, resilience, uh, courage. Um, she would commend to everyone to do their part to push back, essentially, including the lawyers, but not only the lawyers, the activists, the voters, um, you know, she went into politics in part because she thought that that was that that's the arena of struggle um, that African Americans needed to engage at that time, and, and it, it continues to be the case. And also, you know, I, I think she was an optimist, and so even as there is this um, threat to voting rights, uh, there also are um, great achievements that are happening. Um, you know, you have Jim Clyburn, who turns out to be this amazing power broker. You know, I grew up in South Carolina and knew Jim Clyburn from way back, right? And it, it's just amazing to me to see um, the influence that, that he has, um, the uh, increasing diversity of Congress with women and people of color. And uh, so I, I think she, she was an optimist too. And 
she would encourage people to just keep going. Well, anybody who could desegregate the University of Mississippi has to believe <laughs> anything's possible. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Jelani, keep going. This is our final question, Dean Brown Egan, and it's an especially important one. The focus on Motley is extremely timely, uh, given that President Biden has committed to nominating a Black woman to the U.S. Supreme Court. What light does her, her story shed on the significance of this nomination and what the confirmation proceedings um, might entail? Mm. Good question. I will say that this nomination has been a long time coming. As I mentioned before, uh, Constance Baker Motley was on Supreme Court shortlist. She didn't get the nod. Uh, I would emphasize that a part of the reason that she didn't get the nod is because of pushback, including um, you know, among uh, Democrats, but across um, uh, both parties, based on her having been a civil rights lawyer and thus being perceived as, as, as too liberal, uh, right? And because of the, the work that she did on the bench, uh, in issuing decisions that opened up the work, it re enforced the Civil Rights Act, and yet these two, uh, in, in some instances, were seen as too liberal. And so the, the point that I would make is that you know, her identity and her work were weaponized against her. And so even as we um, uh, celebrate this impending nomination, there's a need to be cautious to foreground the accomplishments of these women uh, who are being considered to talk about um, uh, their qualifications, to not flatten them, uh, even as we celebrate the symbolism uh, of this moment, uh, we need to be aware as I think many of us are, that these confirmation processes, the nominations entail you know, scrutiny. Uh, they're, they're not pleasant. Uh, politics is deeply divided. We've already seen uh, some of the rhetoric that's, um, that is uh, you know, pushing back against the very idea of a nomination of an African-American woman. And so, uh, you know, buckle one seatbelts, I would say. Uh, and I, I hope the administration is truly prepared to have the back of, of whoever is, is nominated. Uh, it's important to be prepared um, as we go through this process. Thank you so much, Jelani, for um, doing such a marvelous uh, job of curating the questions. I, uh, unfortunately, our time is up and our program is concluding, but before I thank Tomiko, I wanna to give a shout out to Joel uh, Motley III and his uh, brilliant wife, Isolda, who are in the audience. I've known Joel since uh, 1967, my oldest friend, and to my sister, Charlene hunter Gulp down there in Sarasota. And uh, she's sending her warmest regards to you um, as well, Tomiko. I want to thank and everybody, you know, uh, let's thank uh, Dean Brown Nagan for her moving reading and riveting conversation, and Jelani, of course, and our audience for the terrific questions. We hope that you'll join us for the next Radcliffe Virtual Book Talk featuring Anita Hill on Thursday, February 10th. Today's program has been recorded and will be posted on the Radcliffe website in about a week for information on upcoming Radcliffe virtual programs and to see videos of past events, please visit radcliffe.harvard.edu. And with that, I bid you adieu.